from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 12, recorded on August 25, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Welcome back, Paul. Today we have another of one of your columns on Beyond the Noise. This is the video version of those where Paul explains what he's written. And today I want to take a closer look at your recent column, RFK Jr. and ethnically targeted viruses. So why don't you start by giving us the background on that post, Paul? Right, so it, it started where RFK Jr. was speaking at a fundraising event in New York City at an Italian restaurant where he, in a sort of off-the-cuff manner, talked about a paper that had basically uh, shown that this virus, whether it was deliberately targeted that way or not, um, was made to affect certain groups but not others. So, for example, that it was uh, targeted to uh, Caucasians, to, uh, to blacks, but relatively was sparing of Chinese and Ashkenazi Jews. And, and then later he amplified that by appearing in front of Jim Jordan's uh, committee that looked into sort of the weaponization of information and um, said the same thing. So much so that that paper was basically read into the congressional record at the insistence of one of the Republican congressmen. The, the paper says no such thing. I mean, if you look at that paper, it looks at sort of genetic polymorphisms with about 80,000 or so human genomes, trying to predict based on uh, differences in these two surface proteins on cells that are associated with uh, virus attachment or entry. And you could make a case whether those were the right proteins to look at, but um, that, that based on those differences among populations that you might see differences uh, in terms of susceptibility to COVID-19. Um, the, the, the population frequency, however, was so rare that it would have never defined what would happen in the general population, but could possibly have defined things at an individual level. But in any case, there was nothing in there about specifically making a virus that could do that. And I think... Um, what, what upset me the most about all this was the way um, scientific papers are used in such a uh, casual and disingenuous manner. I mean, anybody who read that paper would see that that's not what it said at all. And I think that when Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says, hey, you don't have to trust me, just read this paper, counts on the fact that people don't read the paper or when they read the paper, they don't necessarily have the expertise to understand it. I mean, I... I listen to TWIV all the time, and I watch you guys who are experts in the areas of virology and immunology and, and microbiology go through papers and, and dissect papers. And there's, you know, often sort of disagreements as to how one would interpret one figure or another, because it's hard. And I think when you ask sort of the public to try and do that without expertise, or without experience, is uh, a lot to ask. Yeah, I think there's so many levels of wrong with uh, what he did there. I mean, the first, as you said, is it's it's a purely bi computational biology paper which doesn't do any experiments, and they're they are trying to predict whether these changes would have an effect on infection, but no one ever did the experiments to answer that. It's a purely theoretical. So for him to use this. As an example, and furthermore, to say it was engineered is totally bogus, right? <laughs> of course. And the paper, as you know, was submitted in April of 2020. So let's assume it was written well before that. I mean, the first deaths in, in the United States were until sort of end of February, beginning of March of 2020. So they were just predicting what would happen. And those predictions ended up being incorrect. I mean, we know that the yeah. most likely reason for being hospitalized or killed by this virus had everything to do with age, with uh, uh, health status, with uh, what vaccination status, um, and really little to do with whether or not you were Chinese or an Ashkenazi Jew. And it's just, uh, it was the whole thing was offensive and um, I think uh, did a lot of harm. Yeah, you know, combining a paper with saying the virus was engineered to do this is, is a little, it's, it's tricky, right? Because he slips it in and under the guise of a, of a scientific paper. So people don't even notice that. They just assume he's correct. But then there's this paper which is saying something in addition. So uh, there are two levels of wrong there, as far as I can tell. 
right? And he gives, always gives himself an out. And he says, well, you know, I don't know if it was deliberate or not. So what is he saying by that? Is he saying it could be deliberate? <laughs> so that's yes. painful. Yes. Um, I, I, as you point out, and this is important to, to emphasize, no study looking for genetic correlates of getting severe COVID has ever pointed out that ACE2 is involved. It's always age, as you said, or comorbidities or interferon deficiencies and so forth. It's not binding to the receptor. And so the paper is essentially not telling us anything to begin with. Right. The susceptibilities are probably better uh, uh, scoped out by looking at immunological proteins rather than at these binding receptors. Now, in your, in your blog post, you point out, you, so you're, you basically say this idea of saying, go read the paper is flawed. And there have been other examples of that, right? Right. I think the most uh, egregious by RFK Jr. is his continual uh, notion, putting forward the notion that ethylmercury or thimerosal, which was a, a preservative that was contained in, in a number of vaccines up until sort of uh, 2000, so more than 20 years ago, that that did harm, that that caused autism and, 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 uh, and hyperactivity disorders or attention deficit disorders or, or a variety of neurological problems. And, and the paper he always points to was a 2005 paper by Thomas Burbacker um, out of, I think, Oregon, where they took um, rhesus macaques, monkeys, and then inoculated them, baby monkeys, with uh, a thimerosal-containing product, and then fed, then did autopsies, sacrificed the animals, did autopsies, and found that, in fact, this ethyl mercury, which is organic mercury, could cross the blood-brain barrier and could be detected in those brains. Not surprising. I mean, organic mercury, like ethyl mercury or methyl mercury, can cross cell membranes, so not terribly surprising. What he then said was that it, it induced this massive inflammatory response. Well, look at that paper. It doesn't say that at all. In fact, when they, they did the autopsy studies on these animals, those brains were perfectly normal and there were no clinical differences between the animals that were inoculated versus those that weren't. But yet he brings that up all the time because he counts on the fact that no one's going to be looking at that paper. If they do look at the paper, they might not be able to understand or, or reason you sure. know, what was shown there. And so I think um, it just... Um, it's 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 hard to watch this and and this this happens i guess for me um the way i interpret this because i've been through this now and for like decades i think for example when the when the varicella vaccine came out in uh, in 1995 the uptake was very slow the first two years the uptake was 10 15 percent for a vaccine that was recommended really for all children in the united states and people would call me parents would call me and they would say i've done my research and i've decided not to get this vaccine but but what what does do your research mean? I mean, what it means for those parents who called me was they read on the Internet people's opinions about the vaccine. They, they weren't reading, obviously, the original articles, of which there were probably 300, and, and with which you would have to have had an expertise in virology or immunology, molecular biology. You would have to, to see the differences, sort of the sequence differences between the vaccine virus and wild-type virus. Well, well, few people have that expertise. Few people are going to read those papers. And I'm not just talking about parents. I'm talking about doctors. <laughs> the, the, who's really reading those papers? At least collectively, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, which I came onto in 1998, or, or the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committees, at least collectively will have read most of those papers because they'll have had an expertise. And often they'll bring experts, say, in that field of, say, of vaccine development or, or the varicella or varicella vaccine onto those committees. So, so they'll have that expertise, but it's it's hard because we want people to be part of the process. You want to, we talk endlessly in clinical medicine about having uh, people involved in the decision making process. But when you do that, you're at some level ceding your expertise to someone who who doesn't have it. And and I think um, it's just. That's just never a message that sells in the 21st century, right? Trust us, we're experts. Um, you want people to be involved, but mm. but can they really be involved in trying to understand uh, subtle differences in one paper versus another? It's hard. When I went on Lex Friedman's podcast, uh, I think two years ago, before we started recording, he said, don't call yourself an expert. People don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, and it when, when, I, when I write books, I never use the word science in the title or subtitle because it's a turnoff, uh -huh. right? And you're right. The word expert is, is a turnoff. I, I completely yeah. agree because we're all experts because we all have Internet access. 
So you end the, the blog post by saying this notion of the public library of science that anyone has access to and can understand sci scientific papers is fraught with problems. But to say such sounds elitist and condescending. And that's where we have a fine line to walk, right? We can't sound that way. Right. Just just as Lex Fridman said, uh, you don't call yourself an expert because because that's what it sounds like. It sounds like you're saying you're smarter than somebody else, whereas, in fact, yeah. it's just your field. It's what you know best. It's, in theory, why people come to you for information. But yeah. you can't ever say that. I mean, I would never say that to, to a parent, you know, that, that, that mm -hmm. you know, you you've come to me and, and, you know, so presumably you want to avail yourself of my expertise. You can never say something like that. You want them to be part of the process. So you try and explain it as simply as you can. Uh, and as clearly as you can, was probably the better way of saying it. So be, realizing that they don't necessarily have a background in the science. So how do you convince people then about the importance of, of scientific studies? Also, it's not hard to find a scientific study that supports any point of view. You know, there, there's before mm. the COVID hit, there were probably 4,000 papers published a day in the scientific and medical literature, which followed, not surprisingly, a bell-shaped curve. Some studies were great. Some studies were awful. Most studies were more or less mediocre. Once COVID hit, that, that number probably doubled. And a lot of the papers that are readily available haven't even been peer-reviewed yet. And so you can, find, you can find a paper that says MMR vaccine causes autism. Published in the sure. Lancet, you know, you can pop find a paper uh, that that supports almost any point of view, and 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 then that's what you're up against trying to get people to understand the difference between papers that are high quality and papers that are low quality. So, what is the solution to this problem when a, someone like RFK Jr. holds up a paper and says it says this, but it doesn't really, and people can't understand the nuances? It's hard. Many scientists even can't. What's the solution to that? I think the solution is to do the kinds of things that you and others do, which is, is in, mm -hmm. in, in This Week in Virology, to, to put out there um, podcasts that are readily available where you go through the science and try and explain it in a compelling and passionate and compassionate way so that people can generally understand it. It's, it's, there are a number of people out there, uh, science bloggers, who try and really get good information out there in an, in an understanding and compelling way. That's all you can do is, is to try and and provide the the information in the in the most compelling way possible. I think that's the solution, but it's it's not a, it's not a ready solution or instant solution. And you're always going to be people who um who just are never going to see it your way. Of course, yeah. Well, we will put a link to this column in the show notes over at Beyond the Noise, so you can uh, read it and think about some of these issues yourself. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.